Okay, let's dive into it. We have a few stories. We're going to talk about Bitcoin's price pumping a little bit, a little mempool action, just a review there. Then we're going to talk about Luxor Technologies, the mining pool uh, launched Lux OS, which is a firmware competitor to Vanesh and Brains OS. Then we're going to talk about Fidelity Crypto, quietly going live, FDIC going back and forth about the signature bank explosion contagion. Get to that later. And we'll end the show on a nice little tweet from Elizabeth Warren, which I think everyone should read just to, you know, boil their blood a little bit this morning. Okay, let's go right into it. So we are recording this a Friday morning. It is 930 Mountain Time. Uh, so it's what 1130 Eastern Time. Bitcoin's price almost broke to $27,000 this morning. It's up around 5% in the 24 hours previously and is up about 30% this week and 56% year to date. That's obviously pretty amazing for everyone's bags. And it's also helping out uh, hash price a little bit. I think we're over seven cents with hash price. The thing that's interesting to me is transaction count, which, or the, the, the fullness of the mempool, if you will, is increasing pretty drastically. Uh, we've seen two large increases in the mempool size since the beginning of the year. Once in February, when ordinals started really going haywire, and then the last week when Bitcoin's price has been going up. Historically, we often see the mempool really fill up with transactions during a bull run when a lot of retail floods into the market. And this current fullness of the mempool is very similar to May of 2022, which is when we had the contagion and the explosion in uh, Terra Luna. So another time for a lot of transactions on chain gonna throw it over to you for your thoughts on all that mempool filling up uh increasing transaction fees good for miners first of all good for miners on both fronts price going up and more transaction fees um so that's exciting it seems the the mempool to me seems to be kind of driven again by ordinals inscriptions it seems like there's like some dgen competition for the 500,000th inscription um and there's some like pre hefty size uh transactions in the in the pool right now which definitely seem like very similar to the ones we were seeing um about a month ago so that's kind of unique and, and and interesting there the bitcoin price pumping i mean i i haven't dug too deep into all the numbers quite yet i'll be looking at it more over the weekend but i feel like people are potentially expecting like the fed to pivot again get into more sort of qe type of situation um, they just came out with kind of like a new loan program based off like the back of the of several banks failing, which uh, seems kind of more of like a, a credit expansionary type of uh, activity rather than kind of what's been similar lately where they've been tightening and raising interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think it's, it's don't fight the Fed season again and Bitcoin might be benefiting from that. Expert analysis from our friend at CoinShares. Love that. Uh, I think you're right. I think that people are looking at Bitcoin right now and saying, like, oh, this is a nice alternative. So we have a nice narrative play there. My question really is, like, who's buying the bags? Is it Bitcoiners just being encouraged that they made the correct purchase and doubling down on it and buying more Bitcoin? Or is it people in traditional worlds who don't really have exposure to Bitcoin actually purchasing it for the first time? We'll get to that in a little bit later with this Fidelity news, which might hint towards the latter there. Let's move on from this topic, though. Uh, let's to move over to Luxor Technologies, which announced Lux OS. This is according to a Bitcoin Magazine article. Luxor Technology is a Bitcoin mining software and service company has released <coughs> Lux OS, the first third-party Antmire compatible firmware fully designed and engineered in the United States. Firmware, of course, is a type of software that is designed to provide specific operating instructions to computing hardware for Bitcoin miners. Firmware allows them to adjust the performance of the basic chips in their Bitcoin mining rigs to optimize for the higher hash rate and improve power efficiency. So people have been waiting for this one for quite a while. The Luxor team has been hinting at it on their Twitter account. Uh, we at Cobus Mining actually did get this a little bit early. We've been testing with it for the last month or so. Can't say a lot about it because we are under NDA on it. But we will be having... Uh, Nick and Matt, who helped design this firmware on the show later next week, I believe, to go through Lux OS. There already looks like some really great components of this, uh, including some things that may fix the Bitmain, F Bitmain S19 XB issue that I detailed 
last week or the week before uh, in an article. So looking forward to that. On the other front, I think this is just shows you more competition in the mining space. Uh, Brains has always had their software out there. Vinesh, another one out there. Chipless, another one. We're going to see more of these people dive into this market because there's a margin for profits. And a team like Luxor, which has a very heavy engineering team, is going to obviously pick this up and run with it. Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting. More options for miners, right? And as you said, more increased competition. Um, you know, there was kind of like a little uh, historical nerves about this back in the day when um, there was like rumors of, of backdooring uh, to ASICs through firmware. And there was, you know, obviously the kind of the, the scandal of covert ASIC boost. Um, and so, I, I mean, having more uh, firmware, firmware to choose from um, that's compatible and uh, especially produced by third parties, not by the manufacturer, I think is good all around. Love it. Yep. We look forward to seeing more of this. Um, I'm looking forward to testing it out myself a little bit and getting under the hood of Lux OS and comparing it against the other ones on the market. Right now, it looks like it's just for Amminer. Hopefully later we see what's minor. Okay. Let's turn over to Fidelity Crypto, which quietly went live. Fidelity is a huge operative ETFs and other investments in the traditional space. I think they're at least top five in terms of assets under management um, for most like brokers, ETFs, portfolio things out there. And they have integrated Bitcoin, Ether, and other crypto purchases into their portfolios. This is a big deal for regular everyday folk who want access to Bitcoin but aren't sure how to get it to have it natively in their portfolio. This is the same product that was actually denounced on Capitol Hill a few months ago. Fidelity has been talking about this for a little bit. They did not make a big release or announcement about it when they rolled it out, but it has been talked about. And Washington, D.C. policymakers, including Elizabeth Warren, have said that this is dangerous because of how volatile these crypto assets are compared to traditional stocks and securities you can put in a portfolio. Hilariously, I don't think anyone in D.C. was really looking at charts this year because there was many, many a stock we could buy a traditional portfolio that did exactly what a lot of crypto tokens did over the last year. This is going to be, I think, a pretty big product. I guess I don't quite know how to say it. A pretty big deal for people who uh, don't have exposure yet, but are really interested in it. I think I think for as much as Coinbase and other products that, that are out there are simple, there's still this barrier where people are afraid to use them. And Fidelity bringing this in natively to itself I think that's going to be like the next wave of adoption. Um, obviously, this is mostly for retail crowd, which is also a big deal. We love retail coming in. Hopefully, they don't get wrecked here, but we do love retail getting into the game. Yeah, I mean, I think this provides like a convenience and legitimacy factor of, of getting into crypto. As you said, you know, having to go to an exchange that you're completely unfamiliar with as someone that may not necessarily follow the crypto space closely but you still want exposure to its investment potential and you have to go to someone like coinbase or kraken or you know insert name here um that you don't have an account at already you don't necessarily know um their risk practices or who's really managing the company but to have your kind of existing brokerage just offer you the option um i think is a huge positive fidelity has kind of long been pioneering um Bitcoin from a traditional asset management perspective. They've been mining since I think like 2012, 2013. Uh, you know, there's some significant alumni that was working at Fidelity, like a, like Amanda Fabiano and, and Nick Carter and um, a few others that are slipping my mind. But yeah, good on Fidelity. Yeah, kind of. They also filed a couple patents, I think, with this um, related to like metaverse and and some other things. So they're definitely Interesting there, they're getting into crypto kind of as a whole because they've been kind of focused on Bitcoin, I think, historically. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. Good on them. Yeah, some more details from the article. Fidelity has 37.1 million total retail accounts. That is one of the first acting portfolio companies of its size to be able to offer this product. Like you said, they have filed some patents as well, and they've been involved with crypto for quite a while. Uh, we look forward to seeing this go live. Uh, let's move over to the last story for the day. The FDIC denies reported signature bank purchaser must divest crypto. This is according to Coindesk. So initially, I got to give some backstory here because it's actually going to be a little more helpful. For those who are not paying attention, Signature Bank obviously was closed down on Sunday. 
Barney Frank, who is a former U.S. congressman and also one of the names on the Dodd-Frank banking regulation that was rolled out in 2010. Uh, he was on the board of Signature, and then he came out after all this happened and said, the reason the FDIC and state regulators shut down Signature Bank was because they have an anti-crypto animus. The FDIC then shot back later and said, that is not the case. It's because things were looking bad on Friday, and they were only looking worse, and we wanted to get ahead of the possible bank run. Barney Frank shot back and said, no, our data was fine. It might have been a little messy, but we were solvent, and we could have opened on Monday. So there's this back and forth. Meanwhile, on crypto Twitter, we're seeing a lot of people upset about this. They're taking Barney Frank's comments and saying, like, this is just proof that there's anti-crypto animus within these uh, regulators. Then we had this information come out from Reuters saying that the sale of signature by FDIC could only occur if the bank or other partner that is buying signature would divest all crypto firms from the bank. And signature banked about 25% of its clients were crypto uh, company. So it's a significant portion of its user base would have to be divested. Then later, after that was run by a lot of people on Twitter, Blockworks came back, did some more reporting, talked to the FDIC, and that was actually not the case. The FDIC has denied that. So we have more full picture of what's actually going on here. The FDIC doesn't seem to have any angle here with the crypto, besides maybe reading into a little bit. I don't know. There's still a lot of back and forth, even if you are able to sell this bank with all the crypto firms attached to it. There's still some questions about why this bank was shut down and why Barty Frank would make these comments. It's it's messy, right? We don't have full clarity yet. I'm glad that Blockworks is out there um, kind of digging and asking questions, um, which is exciting. But I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's fair for people to theorize um, and question what's really happening here. Uh, if Signature Bank was truly... Um, solvent on their own, not in sort of a, a critical scenario where they needed to be taken over and seized. Um, and I mean, the FDIC, the, 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 they, they need to provide some sort of uh, some statements and clarity on what exactly was happening or else people are going to kind of you know, run wild with their theories. It's, it's like only natural. But we'll kind of see what all comes from this. I think this is this is an ongoing story and really um the the crypto piece of this is kind of like the side story to to me in the broader picture um there's like significant kind of risk here for small and mid-sized banks to basically uh go insolvent to some to some degree um there's you know high amounts of unrealized losses as as you've seen on twitter and many charts going around um for these banks the larger ones seem sort of okay and it's not really a credit risk issue, but more of the fact that a lot of the bonds that were previously bought when interest rates were close to zero are now significantly discounted. Uh, if they were to actually be sold for their for their market value, they would be sold at a, at a major loss, um, which would hurt the ability for these banks to actually service their withdrawals. I think that's like the major part of the story, and we'll, we'll like see how it unfolds in the future, but it's definitely interesting that several of these banks have a large amount of crypto clients, which is significant to kind of the industry as a whole. Yeah, I like the point you brought up there, and I'm actually going to share a video based on what you're just saying. The key question here with the bailouts, SVB and Signature, is what will the Federal Reserve and the FDIC bail out, and what will they not bail out? And increasingly, it looks like they're willing to bail out any firms that they deem uh, important or strategic, while the leaving smaller banks in a bad spot this uh i think this was from yesterday this whole testimony from janet yellen the u.s treasurer really captures the moment well so let's take a look and listen into it will the deposits in every community bank in oklahoma regardless of their size be fully insured now are they fully recovered every bank every community bank in oklahoma regardless of the size of the deposit Will they get the same treatment that SVBP just got or Signature Bank just got? A bank only gets that treatment if a majority of the FDIC board, a supermajority, a supermajority of the Fed board, and I, in consultation with the president, determine that the failure to protect uninsured depositors would create systemic risk 
and significant economic and financial consequences. So what is and your we plan? Make that determination. Right. right. So, so what is your banks. plan to keep large depositors from moving their funds out of community banks into the big banks? We have seen the mergers of banks over the past decade. I'm concerned you're about to accelerate that by encouraging anyone who has a large deposit in a community bank to say, we're not going to make you whole, but if you go to one of our preferred banks, we will make you whole at that point. We're, that's certainly not something that we're encouraging. That is happening right now. That is happening because depositors are concerned about the bank failures that have happened and whether or not other banks could also um, no, it, it, fail. No, it's happening and because it's, you're fully insured no matter what the amount is if you're in a big bank. You're not fully insured if you're in a community bank. Well, you're not fully insured. And you, you big, were at signature, the, and the it, big, was, it just barely met that threshold. You were at signature. Well, we felt that there was a serious risk of contagion that could have brought down and triggered runs on many banks, um, and that something, given that our judgment is that the banking system overall is safe and sound, um, depositors should have confidence in the system, and we took these actions. So there's a special assessment that's been done on community banks in my state and all banks across the country. Was there any discussion that that special assessment would only apply to the larger banks, or was it always assumed the special assessment would cover every bank, including rural banks in my state? Um, I, I think I, I'm not certain what the rules are around that. Um, that that's uh, for the FDIC to determine. It, it, it has. Okay, we'll take a break from that there, but definitely some interesting language coming out of that testimony yesterday. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we weren't planning on showing that video, but you spurred that thought. So, you know, there's just like definitely like a little, little bit of a political regime going on here with bank deposits right now and something to pay attention to. We'll leave the show with this tweet from Elizabeth Warren. She said, quote, it's no wonder the American people are skeptical of a system that holds millions of struggling student loan borrowers in limbo but steps in overnight to ensure that billion-dollar crypto firms won't lose a dime in deposits. So I think, I think we have a few things going on here. Some banks being supported, some banks not. There's this anti-crypto argument from a lot of people in D.C. There's an anti-tech angle. Uh, a lot of crypto people are upset right now. I know this is affecting everyone in crypto. Like Marathon Digital and so many others were banked at Signature. Uh, this is a, it's a huge deal for the industry and something we're going to be watching. Any final thoughts on that, Matt? Um, I think I have a lot of final thoughts, but I, you know, this is, it's all triggered by, uh, the feds actions. Um, right. They, they, there were stimulus programs that came out, right. There was a, was basically an influx of cash to everybody who then deposited that at the, at several different banks, right. Along with going out and buying consumer goods and services, et cetera, et cetera. So the banks had an influx of cash. They were told that inflation would be transitory, so they did, that took that cash. They bought a bunch of treasuries. They didn't expect the uh, um, increase in interest rates at the sort of pace that happened. Rather, that's exactly what happened. And it was at an unprecedented rate that's never really happened in, in uh, the history of the United States. That basically made it so the securities, the bonds that these banks invested in, um, significantly decreased in market value to, to, the, to the point where the cash that these banks had on hand, if they had significantly large business accounts, right, to service, it, if there was withdrawals from um, depositors that had basically millions of dollars, much above the FDIC $250,000 limit, they would have to sell those securities at a loss, um, which is, is really what triggered all this. So kind of all, everything goes back um, to the messaging of the Fed, the stimulus, and the the increase in interest rate hikes, and I I, I think like you reap what you sow um, in this scenario, and I mean they got to dig themselves out of the hole. They basically came out with this loan program to where you can take out loans from the Fed um, at the kind of the issuance value, the fair value of um, the of the actual bonds rather than the discounted value, which completely reverses the the quantitative tightening that's been that's been happening. Um, it's basically not QE redux, like 2.0, where we're going to get, um, again, increased uh, monetary supply, 
And I think like what people are seeing in this is is a reverse course of U.S. monetary policy and really, you know, things that are uh, kind of anti-dollar investments like Bitcoin and commodities and oil are, you know, potentially going to benefit from that. I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to follow uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but I guess I'll just leave it there. You heard it here first from two armchair economists. Okay, we'll close the conversation there. Matt, thank you again for joining. We'll see everyone again next week. For those waiting on your inscriptions, they are done. We're trying to do a special thing with them where we can like mint them as a batch and send them out to everybody. Uh, so looking forward to sending those out. We'll put them on Twitter as well so people can see like the, the cool inscriptions we made. We're also kind of waiting for the mempool to chill out right now because it's like hundred dollars plus to mint anything on chain at the moment so anyways we'll see you guys again next week peace